If you're dealing with food waste, I just put some suggestions on here if anybody were to happen to get food waste in the future. Um, the most contaminants that I get are silverware, bottles, and gloves. Rubber gloves, because people use rubber gloves in the restaurant industry. And so that's what I was saying. If you were to want to work with a restaurant or if any of you are interested in like starting a compost pickup service or a composting service where you're picking it up and making compost, you really have to educate people in the restaurant industry. They're normally working pretty fast and they're not caring about what they're throwing away. They're just trying to make food. And so it's a change in their mind about like, this goes here, this goes here, this doesn't go here. Uh, because there's a lot of contamination that comes through uh, or people after the food is made and they're throwing their foods away and they're throwing away their silverware by accident and their plastic straws and their cans. Uh, so you want food waste that's as fresh as possible. Get it and use it as fast as you can. You don't really want like a bin of food waste that's been sitting around for a couple weeks that's just gotten completely nasty. You can work with it. It's going to have gone anaerobic and you're going to have anaerobic microorganisms that are in there. And if you were to take, you know, like one bin that's anaerobic and spread it out over to a 200 foot compost pile, it's not going to make that big of a difference. But on a smaller scale, you know, you're going to want to try and get food and, and put it and compost it more quickly and efficiently. No meat, right? Or doesn't matter? It depends. He said no meat. So a lot of people talk about not doing dairy or meat or one other one. If you're a home composter, a lot of people don't like using, most people don't like using them because they're going to attract more rats and, and cats and raccoons and stuff like that. I've done food waste on different scales. The last time I did this larger pile, I'm sure that I had some possums come in because I live by the woods. But in my smaller piles, I've never had issues with raccoons or cats. And I live way out in the country. But yeah, it's not a matter of that stuff not breaking down. Microorganisms will break down anything, rocks, anything. It, it's just uh, either on a household scale, people don't want pests or uh, in a facility, on a regulated facility, there's usually certain tiers of what people can take. So there's a tier of um, yard waste and, and debris like that from tree trimming and grass clippings and stuff like that. And then you move up into another tier of that plus vegetable waste. And then there's another tier of uh, meats, dairies, and stuff like that. And so it's a matter of regulations and like having to get permits and things like that if you were to sell this compost. Uh, food waste is n pretty much 90% moisture. You don't really have to worry about adding a whole lot of moisture when you're working with food waste. Uh, so if you have some dry wood chips and some dry other materials, you don't necessarily have to uh, be as concerned with getting them soaked down before you add your food waste because they're going to soak up the moisture from the food waste. And the best way to take food, so when you have a bin of food waste, it's like just either a bunch of chunky stuff or soup when you're getting it. It's not really easy to control. And so the best way of handling it, uh, if you know you're going to be getting some food waste in, would be to make a bed of brown material like wood chips and leaves and uh, uh, you know, just lay out something that's going to accept your food waste that you can then dump your food waste onto that. And then it'll soak up all the moisture and you can kind of turn it all together and mix it. Because otherwise, if you're dumping your food waste, you're going to have like a bunch of liquid and stuff just like going all over the place. And it's going to be hard to clean up and be a mess. And then you have to be aware of state regulations. I think as far as I've seen, North Carolina is pretty much similar to Tennessee. And it's kind of like the tiers that I was talking about. And then if you're accepting food waste just to make compost on your farm, make on your farm and use on your farm, there's not a lot of regulation with that. It's when you want to start selling it, making it on a larger scale, and then selling a product that you have to worry about. Uh, codes and dealing with uh, environmental regulations and things like that. Cool. So moving on with thermal compost. So with thermal composting, when you're trying to get a pile to heat up, you need to at least three to four cubic feet of organic matter or thermal mass to keep and maintain that heat. And with a pile like that, if you've got the right ingredients, it doesn't matter what the temperature is outside, you're still going to be having temperatures that are 130 or above in the core of your compost pile. The main question that people normally have is when do you need to turn your pile? 
And if you read about compost like in a book or something like that, it normally says on average every three days. And it does kind of work out to every three days if you're watching temperatures and things are correctly built and you're trying to focus on biology. But otherwise, we want to be pushing temp high temps of 145 to 155 degrees. We want to have higher temps to where we're getting faster decomposition. And most people who are doing thermal composting are like a large scale facility where they've got real estate that they want to get turned over. They've got a space that they want to make compost and get it out the door and make compost and get it out the door. So you're wanting to break things down as fast as possible. So the higher, like I said before, the higher your temperature, the faster a breakdown you're getting. Uh, I already explained how you have higher temps and the faster microbial action. So you make a pile. Hopefully you have the right mix of carbon to nitrogen and browns to greens. If everything goes well within one to three days, sometimes for some reason it'll take up to a few days for it to really kick in, but you'll start to get higher temps. Uh, so you want to watch for that 131 degrees. So once you hit 131 degrees, your pile has started. And then like if you're wanting to focus on organic regulations, you want to keep it that hot for at least 15 days. So if your pile reaches 160 degrees, you want to turn it. At least the first week it's good to be taking, taking temperatures on a pile in the morning and the night. You want to be monitoring morning and night uh, because your temps can drop or climb rather quickly. So if you go, you make a pile, you check it in the morning time, you see 150 degrees, you go out at night time and you're at 160 degrees, your pile will most likely keep going up overnight and you don't want it to hit over 160 degrees. So you want to go ahead and turn it then when you've hit 160 degrees. If you're hitting 160 degrees, you want to turn. If you're taking temperatures and you're at like 140, then the next day you're at 145, 145, 145, and then all of a sudden you come out the next day and it says 135. Something in the middle there has gone anaerobic or is starting to go anaerobic and you want to get some air in there immediately. So if you've dropped in temperature, you want to turn your pile. If you see actinobacteria, and I don't have a photo of actinobacteria, you can Google a photo of actinobacteria. Uh, actinobacteria, it's also called actinomycetes. Um, it's a type of bacteria that looks like fungi in the structure that it grows. It looks like little white powdery stuff in a compost pile. This is the core of your pile. This is the outside of your pile. And usually it's like 9 to 12 inches. It's always this, you'll have this layer that's aerobic and then all of a sudden you'll have this layer that you'll see either a little spot like this or like this big thing and, it, and it'll be 3 to usually 6 inches thick of white actinobacteria and that means that you're starting to go anaerobic and you want to get oxygen in there right away. So actinobacteria gives compost its earthy smell and that's why it smells like a forest, which is good. But actinobacteria has been shown to have um, bad effects on mycorrhizal fungi. How do you spell that? Actinobacteria, A-C-T-I-N-O. Uh, if you're looking it up, it's most likely going to be actinomycetes. So, so originally it was called actinomycetes because it looks like fungi and my, mycomycetes is fungi. And then they discovered that it's a bacteria. So people more in the know call it bacteria and actinobacteria now, but it's usually referred to as actinomycetes, M-Y-C-E-T-S. Does it compete with the mycorrhizal fungi or? It suppresses it. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily, well, I mean, in a way that's competition, but it suppresses mycorrhizal fungi. So 90 to 95 percent of terrestrial plants in the world have mycorrhizal associations. The ones that don't are early succession plants and brassicas. So if you're growing brassicas, they're not going to have any mycorrhizal association and it's okay to have actinobacteria in there. So if you're someone who grows nothing but like brassicas or greens and things like that, um, it's not as big of a deal. But when you're trying to get more fungi in there, we want to keep it more aerobic. So turn at 160, turn if your temperatures drop, turn if you see actinobacteria. If you're trying to follow organic regulations, there's going to be a lot of times where, the, according to the rules I just gave you, 
you're like, well, my pile's been at 140, 140, 140, 140, 142. It's not really going up. It's not really going down. It's just kind of maintaining its temperature. But you have to turn it to maintain organic regulations. Then I normally go with like, if I've turned it and then this, the temperatures kind of maintain themselves and I'm not seeing actinobacteria, then I'll turn it two to three days later. By the third day, I will say I want to have turned it. If that makes sense to everybody. You also want to go by smells. See if you ever smell anything that smells bad to you. If you smell ammonia, it means that you're losing nitrogen in the form of a gas. If you smell sulfur, it means that you're losing, I can't remember what it is, in the form of a gas. Uh, anything that you smell that smells nasty to you, it, it's going to be detrimental to a plant. So if you smell something that doesn't smell right to you, that doesn't smell earthy or good, our noses are really good indicators of what's good and what's bad from our instincts and our genes passed down to us. So if it smells bad to you, turn it. Get, get some air in there. And then I mentioned if you know, if you can tell that your temps have been climbing and you know it's 5 o'clock at night, and you're like at 158 and you were at 145 earlier in the day, it's most likely going to go up. And I would go ahead and turn it so that you don't have to be like, oh, I should come out and check it at 10 o'clock at night and then have to turn, it, turn your pile at 10 o'clock at night. Uh huh. You're probably going to go over this, but would there be a correction for a, a pile that's just not going up in 10, like it's just in 120, 130? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I did not include that in this. So if you were to put your materials together, and it's not going up in temperature, you are most likely don't have enough nitrogen. Most likely don't have enough nitrogen. Uh, so you would either want to add more green material in there. It would be better to have a high nitrogen source and put like chicken manure in there and start off with like 10% chicken manure and that'll, that should get it going then, yeah. The other thing is, so when, uh, I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes when I talk about a hand turn pile, but I'm going to go ahead and set this up to give you an example. So this is hardware cloth, and it's half inch hardware cloth. You can get this in different sizes, like quarter inch, I think maybe eighth inch. The half inch is easiest to get bungee cords into, and it's not too big that you've got material falling out of it. And this is a three foot one, but I normally try to buy the four feet one. I didn't realize that I brought the three foot one for an example. There's different ways that people use to make compost piles. There's the tumblers, like those black tumbler, tumblers that you can turn, or uh, pallets. People like to reuse pallets. So this has been rolled up for so long that it's fighting against me. But these are nice in that I'm going to hold it up in a second here. You can make a circle out of that and bungee it and put your materials in here. And if you're trying to be super exact or like do a scientific research, you can actually you know, measure these things and, and put your layers in there and be like, OK, I got exactly three inches of this. And I've got exactly two inches of that. And know like exactly what your, pretty much exactly except for airspace, what your ratios are. Uh, so when you first mix this, I'm not sure if I've got a picture of the layers in there. You're going to have you know, like wood chips on the bottom. You're going to have a layer of wood chips, and then you'll have something green, and then a layer of brown, and then a layer of green, and then you know leaves, straw, food waste, leaves, straw, food waste, wood chips. Um, it will start without mixing it together. If you just put those in there, it's going to start to heat up. But on your first turn, when you really get those things mixed together and get the browns and greens and carbon and nitrogen touching more, it really activates it a lot more, and you're going to start to get higher temperatures that way. So normally, like when I'm making a pile, I won't necessarily make, I'm not if I know if I'm, under, if I'm explaining this correctly. I'm not necessarily mixing all the ingredients when I make a smaller pile. I'm putting it in there in thin layers. And then my first turn, it's actually getting all mixed together. And we'll go into more detail of this in a second. So when you say turn, you mean pull the cage off and, yeah, it, and it, just rearrange the whole pile? Yep, and I'll go into that in just a second here. I'm a question. Yeah. Do you put it right on the ground or do you suggest some kind of a platform? Or I like to put it right in the ground. I don't know. I've seen people that have been taking Elaine's class that have been using a pallet. 
and putting it on a pallet. And I'm guessing that they're trying to get oxygen from underneath to go up and flow up through there. I like, that's why I kept saying is that a pile, a thing of wood chips on the bottom. I like to start off with wood chips on the very bottom because then you've got some nice fluff on the very bottom that you got air moving in underneath there. But I like to have it on the ground, directly on the ground because like I said, you've got microorganisms that are moving in from the soil. And then also not necessarily right away because of the heat, but eventually you've got earthworms that are gonna be coming in and moving in from the soil up into your pile. So, you know, I'll have something that's four feet tall and I'll find worms that have come up there. It's obviously not from the material because I built it and there wasn't any worms when I did it. They've come up from the soil and they're way up high in there. And when you say wood chips, is that, that's different from mulch? You're talking about just chips where trees have been cut down? Uh, I mean, some people use wood chips as mulch, but yeah, it would be like when you cut down a tree and you put it through a chipper. Right. Yeah. Moving on, turning continued. I touched on actinobacteria, nasty smells. If you have a heavy rain come, hopefully all of your material hasn't gotten soaked, but if just the outside has gotten soaked, you can maybe turn it and it hasn't gotten too soaked where you can get that stuff mixed in there. You want to cover if there is a chance of rain, and I'll go on to explain like kind of the covers that I use as I go along with the presentation here. How to turn, it depends on your size of your pile. We're going to talk about hand-turned piles. We're going to talk about windrows and larger piles. If you've got a hand-turned pile, I didn't bring my pitchfork with me, but I like to use a 10-time pitchfork. Um, they're perfect. They're, it looks like a, a snow shovel, like one of those flat snow shovels, except it's a, a pitchfork. So you don't get a lot of material that you're losing through the, the tines. Uh, if you're moving up in scale, you can use a skid steer or a tractor, a loader. And uh, if you have the money, you can spend money on a windrow turner. Uh, and there's different sizes of windrow turners. And I'll show you some examples of those in the upcoming pictures here.